Welcome to NCLEX Avenue course. This episode contains an actual questions on infection control for New York State mandatory training. Subscribe to our channel for more videos. Question number one. Ms. A, a registered nurse, has supervisory responsibility for a licensed practical nurse, Mr. B. Ms. A. Observe Mr. B change a dressing on a patient, and then go to another patient's room without changing gloves or washing his hands. Miza has noticed that this has occurred at other times as well. She made a mental note of it and planned to speak to Mr. B about this. Unfortunately, Miza was distracted by other priorities on the unit and neglected to follow up with Mr. B. What could be the outcome of this situation? A. Mr. B could be charged with unprofessional conduct for failing to adhere to scientifically accepted principles and practices of infection control. B. Miza could be charged with unprofessional conduct for failing to ensure that Mr. B, for whom Miza has administrative and clinical oversight, adheres to scientifically accepted principles and practices of infection control. C. Both A and B. D. None of the above. Answer letter B. Question number 2. According to the CDC, there are approximately 2 million healthcare-acquired infections, highs annually. Of these infections, almost 99,000 people die annually. A. True. B. False. Answer letter A. True. Question number 3. Infections can be prevented by interrupting one or more of the links in the chain of infection. This can be achieved through A. Utilizing personal protective equipment, PEEP, and standard precautions while providing care and treatment to patients in an acute care hospital. Be ensuring that healthcare staff who serve patients in a home care agency are in good health and are current with recommended adult immunizations. C. Cleaning and disinfecting equipment for a freestanding surgery center while adhering to manufacturers and CDC guidelines. D. All of the above. Answer letter D. All of the above. Question number 4. According to the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, the most common route of exposure of U.S. hospital healthcare workers to blood or other body fluids is through A. Contact with mucous membranes of the eyes, nose or mouth B. Percutaneous injuries with contaminated sharp instruments, such as needles and scalpels C. Human bites D. Exposure though broken or abraded skin Answer letter B Question number 5 According to the CDC healthcare personnel only practice hand hygiene about half the time. A. True. B. False. Answer letter A. True. Question number 6. The CDC's Hand Hygiene Guidelines 2002 covered in this course recommend that if hands are not visibly soiled, use an alcohol-based hand rub for routinely decontaminating hands in clinical situations. Alternatively, wash hands with an antimicrobial soap and water in clinical situations. A. True. B. False. Answer letter A. True. Question number 7. A hierarchy of controls are used to minimize the risk of infection in healthcare facilities. These controls include legal and regulatory controls, administrative and training controls, engineering controls, work practice controls. A. True. B. False. Answer letter B. False. Question number 8. Standard precautions are based on the concept that blood and body fluids must be treated as if infectious, therefore personal protective equipment, PEEP, is needed as a barrier to transmission of infectious agents. The choice of PEEP is determined by the type of interaction the healthcare worker has with the patient. A. True. B. False. Answer letter A. True. Question number 8. Personal protective equipment. PEEP for standard precautions include all the following except A. Gloves when touching body blood, body fluids, secretions, excretions, contaminated items, 4. Touching mucous membranes and non-intact skin. B. Gowns during procedures and patient care activities when contact of clothing exposed skin with blood slash body fluids, secretions, or excretions is anticipated. C. Gloves, gowns and masks for all routine care. D. Masks and goggles or a face shield during patient care activities likely to generate splashes or sprays of blood, body fluids, secretions and excretions. Answer letter C. Question number 10. 
The procedure for removing gloves is grab outside edge near wrist, peel away from hand, turning glove inside out, hold in opposite gloved hand, slide ungloved finger under the wrist of the remaining glove, peel off from inside, creating a bag for both gloves. Discard. A. True. B. False. Answer letter A. True. Question number 11. The level of contamination on healthcare equipment and environmental surfaces is dependent upon A. Types of microorganisms B. Number of microorganisms C. Potential for cross-contamination D. All of the above Answer letter D. All of the above Question number 12. Healthcare workers do not need to immediately attend to an occupational exposure to blood or body fluids since prophylactic treatment is most effective if administered as soon as possible after antibodies form. A. True. B. False. Answer letter B. False. Question number 13. Since the 1992 bloodborne pathogen standard in which hepatitis B vaccination has been required to be provided to healthcare workers as well as standard precautions, the incidence of occupational transmission of the hepatitis B virus has decreased by 96%. A. True. B. False. Answer letter B. False. Question number 14. After percutaneous injury with a contaminated sharp instrument, the average risk of HIV infection is A. 0.8%. B. 30%. C. 0.3%. D. 6%. Answer letter C. 0.3%. Question number 15. For professionals who practice in settings where handling, cleaning, and reprocessing equipment, instruments, or medical devices is performed in a dedicated sterile processing department. It is important to understand core concepts and principles of infection control, including standard and universal precautions including PEEP, cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization, appropriate application of safe practices for handling instruments, medical devices, and equipment. Designation and physical separation of patient care areas from cleaning and reprocessing areas. Verify with those responsible for reprocessing what steps are necessary prior to submission. Regarding pre-cleaning, soaking, etc. A. True. B. False. Answer letter A. True. Question number 16. Cleaning involves the removal or destruction of all microorganisms and their spores. A. True. B. False. Answer letter B, false. Question number 17. The CDC guidelines utilize the Spalding classification, which divides instruments and items for patient care into critical, semi-critical or non-critical items. Depending on the category, planning for disinfection or sterilization can be determined for the most part. Which of the following are correct? A. Critical items are enter sterile tissue, or the vascular system must be sterile. Critical items have A. High risk for infection if they are contaminated with any microorganism. B. Non-critical items are those that come in contact with intact skin but not mucous membranes. C. Semi-critical items contact mucous membranes or non-intact skin. D. All of the above. Answer letter D. All of the above. Question number 18. All the following are related to proper sharps disposal strategies except a. Use a sharps container capable of maintaining its impermeability after waste treatment to avoid subsequent physical injuries during final disposal. B. Place disposable syringes with needles, including sterile sharps that are being discarded, scalpel blades, and other sharp items into puncture-resistant containers located as close as practical to the point of use. C. Do not bend, recap, or break used syringe needles before discarding them into a container. D. Make thorough use of a sharps container by overfilling the container, even if the contents are not well contained, just be careful. Answer letter D. Question number 19. Which of the following is true about safe injection? A. It does not harm the recipient, does not expose the provider to any avoidable risks, and does not result in waste that is dangerous for the community. B. It includes practices intended to prevent transmission of bloodborne pathogens between one patient and another, or between a healthcare worker and a patient, and also to prevent harms, such as needlestick injuries. C. Both A and B. D. Neither A or B. Answer letter C. Both A and B. 
Question number 20. Recent headlines in New York State and in other states have identified incidents of unsafe injection practices in some healthcare facilities, which resulted in outbreaks of bloodborne pathogens. According to the CDC, the two two main breaches of infection control practices were reinsertion of used needles into a multiple dose, vial, or solution container, such as a saline bag, use of a sterile, single use, disposable needle and syringe for each injection given. Use of a single needle or syringe to administer intravenous medication to multiple patients. Failure to use a 1-100 dilution 500-615 ppm available chlorine to decontaminate non-porous surfaces. A. All of the above. B. None of the above. C. 1 and 3. D. 1, 2 and 3. Answer letter C. 1 and 3.